the evening benediction begins. Night comes, out of the craters rise the mists. It looks as though the holes were full of ghostly secrets. The white vapor creeps painfully round before it ventures to, to steal away over the edge. Then long streaks stretch from crater to crater. It is chilly. I am on sentry and stare into the darkness. My strength is exhausted, as always after an attack, and so it is hard for me to be alone with my thoughts. They are not properly thoughts. They are memories in which my weaknesses, my weakness haunts me and strangely moves me. The parachute lights soar upwards, and I see a picture, a summer evening, and I'm in the cathedral cloister, and look at the tall rose trees that bloom in the middle of the little, uh, little cloister garden where the monks lie buried. Around the walls are stone carvings of the great stations of the cross, of the stations of the cross. There is no one there. A great quietness rules in this blossoming quadrangle. The sun lies warm on the heavy gray stones. I place my hand upon them and feel the warmth. At the right hand corner of the green cathedral spire ascends into the pale blue sky of the evening. Between the glowing columns of the cloister is the cool darkness that only churches have. And I stand there and wonder whether when I am 20, I shall have experienced the bewildering emotions of love. The image is alarmingly near. It touches me before it dissolves in, in the light of the next st star shell. I lay hold of my rifle to see that it is in trim. The barrel is wet. I take it in my hands and rub off the moisture with my fingers. Between the meadows, lie, uh, between the meadows behind our town, there stands a line of old poplars by a stream. They were visible from a great distance, and although they grew on one bank only, we called them the Poplar Avenue. Even as children, we had a great love for them. They drew us vaguely thither. We played truant the whole day by them and listened to their rustling. We sat beneath them on the bank of the stream and let our feet hang in the bright, swift waters. The pure fragrance of the water and the melody of the wind in the poplars held our fancies. We loved them dearly and the image of those days still makes my heart pause in its beating. It is strange that all the memories that come have these two qualities. They are always completely calm, that is predominant in them. And even if they are not really calm, they become so. They are soundless apparitions that speak to me with looks and gestures silently, without any word. And it is the alarm of their silence that forces me to lay hold of my sleeve and my rifledness, lest I should abandon myself to the liberation and allurement in which my body would dilate and gently pass away into the, into the still forces that lie behind these things. They are quiet in this way because quietness is so unattainable for us now. At the front, there is no quietness and the curse of the front reaches so far that we never pass beyond it. Even in the remote depots and rest areas, the droning and the muffled noise of shelling is always in our ears. We are never so far off that it is no more to be heard, but these last few days, it has been unbearable. Their stillness is the reason why these memories of former times do not awaken desire so much as sorrow, a vast, inapprehensible melancholy. As soon as we had such desires, but they return not, or once we had such desires, but they return not, they are the past. They belong to another world that has gone from us. In the barracks, they call forth a rebellious, wild craving for their return, for then they, they, they were still bound to us. We belong to them and they to us even though we were already absent from them. They appeared in the soldiers' songs, which we sang as we marched between the glow of the dawn and the black silhouettes of the forest to drill on the moor. They were a powerful remembrance that was in us and came from us. But here in the trenches, they are completely lost to us. They arise no more. We are dead and they stand remote on the horizon. They are a mysterious reflection, an apparition that haunts us, that we fear and love without hope. They are strong and our desire is strong, but they are unattainable and we know it. And even in these scenes of our youth, we were, were given back to us, we would hardly know what to do. The tender secret influence that, had, that passed from them into us could not rise again. We might be amongst them and move in them. We might remember and love them and be stirred by the sight of them, but it would be like, be like gazing at the photograph of a dead comrade. Those are his features at his face and, and the days we spent together take on a mournful life in the memory, but the man himself, it is not. We can never regain the old intimacy with those scenes. It is not any recognition of their beauty and, the, and their significance that attracted us, but the communion, the feeling of a comradeship, with the things and events of our existence, which cuts us off and made us, 
and made the world of our parents a thing, of incom a thing incomprehensible to us. For then we surrendered ourselves to events and were lost in them. And the least little thing was enough to carry us down the stream of eternity. Perhaps it was only the privilege of our youth, but, but as yet we recognized no limits and saw nowhere an end. We had that thrill of expectation in the blood which unites us with the course of our days. Today we would pass through the scenes of our youth like travelers. We are burnt up by hard facts. Like tradesmen, we understand distinctions and like butchers necessities. We are no longer untroubled, we are indifferent. We might exist, we might exist there, but should we really live there? We are, like forlo we are forlorn like children and experienced like old men. We are crude and sorrowful and superficial. I believe we are lost. My hands grow cold and my flesh creeps. And yet the night is warm. Only the mist is cold. This mysterious mist that trails over the dead and sucks from them their last creeping life. By morning they will be pale and green and their blood congealed and black. Still the parachute rockets shoot up and cast their pitiless light over the stony landscape, which is full of craters and frozen lights like a moon. The blood beneath my skin brings fear and restlessness to my thoughts. They become feeble and tremble. They want warmth and life. They cannot persist without solace without illusion, they are disordered before the naked picture of despair. I hear the rattle of mess tins and immediately feel a strong desire for warm food. It would do me good and comfort me. Painfully, I force myself to wait until I am relieved. Then I go into the dugout and find a mug of barley. It is cooked in fat and tastes good. I eat it slowly. I remain quiet, but the others are in a better mood for the shelling has died down. The days go by and the incredible hours follow one another as a matter of course. Attacks alternate with counterattacks and slowly the dead pile up in the field of, field of craters between the trenches. We are able to bring in most of the wounded that do not lie far too far off, but many have, to, have long to wait and we listen to them dying. For one of them, we search two days in vain. He must be lying on his belly and unable to turn over. Otherwise, it is hard to understand why we cannot find him, for it is only when a man has his mouth close to the ground that it is impossible to gauge the direction of his cry. He must have hit, been hit badly, one of those nasty wounds neither so severe that, that they exhaust the body at once in a man's dreams in a half swoon, nor so light that a man endures the pain in hope of becoming well again. Cat thinks he's either broken a pelvis or shot through the spine. His chest could not, be, could not have been injured, otherwise he would not have such a strength to cry out. But if, we're, but if we're any other kind of wound, it would be possible to see him moving. He gradually grows hoarser. The voice is so strangely pitched that it seems to be everywhere. The first night, some of our fellows go out three times to look, at him, look for him. But when they think they have located him and crawl across, the next time they hear, that, they hear the voice, it seems to come from somewhere else altogether. We search in vain until dawn. We scrutinize the field all day with glasses, but discover nothing. On the second day, the calls are, are fainter. That will, be, that will be because his lips and mouth have become dry. Our company commander has promised, has promised us, uh, sorry. Our company commander has promised next turn of leave with three days extra to anyone who finds him. This is a powerful inducement, but we would do all that is possible without that, for his cry is terrible. Cat and Crop even go out in the afternoon, and Albert gets the lobe of his ear shot off in, in, in consequence. It is to no purpose. They come back without him. It is easy to understand what he cries. At first, he must have called only for help. The second night, he must have had some delirium. He talked with his wife and his children. We often detected the name Elise. Today, he merely weeps. By evening, the voice dwindles to a croaking, but it persists still through the whole night. We hear, we hear it so distinctly because the wind blows toward our line. In the morning when we suppose he must have already long gone to his rest, there comes across to us one last gurgling rattle. The days are hot and the dead lie unburied. We cannot fetch them all in. If we did, we should not know, know what to do with them. The shells will bury them. Many have their bellies swollen up like balloons. They hiss, belch, and make movements. The gases in them make noises. The sky is blue and without clouds. In the evening, it grows sultry and the heat rises from the earth. When the wind blows towards us, it brings the smell of blood, which is very heavy and sweet. This deathly exhalation from the shell holes seems to be a mixture of chloroform and putrefaction and fills us with, with nausea and retching. The nights become quiet 
and the hunt for copper driving bands and the silken parachutes of the French star shells begins. Why the driving bands are so desirable, no one knows exactly. The collectors merely assert that they are valuable. Some have collected so many that they will stoop under the weight of them when we go back. But Hayi gives at last gives us gives a reason. He intends to give them to his girl to supplement her garters. At this, the, Phrygi the Phrygians explode with mirth. They slap their knees. By Jove, though, he's a wit. Hayi he, hi he is. He's got brains. Tiaden especially can hardly contain himself. He takes the largest of the rings in his hands and every now and then puts his legs through it to show how much slack there is. Hi, man, she must have legs like legs. His thoughts mount somewhat higher and, behind, and a behind too she must have like, a, like an elephant. He cannot get over it. I wish I could play hot hand with her, with her once, my hat. Hi, beams, proud that his girl should receive so much appreciation. She's a nice bit, he says with self-satisfaction. The parachutes are turned to more practical uses. According to the size of the bust, three or perhaps four will make a blouse. Crop and, Crop and I will use them as handkerchiefs. The others send them home. If the women could see what, what risk these bits of rag are, are often obtained, they would be horrified. Cat surprises Tiaid in endeavoring with, perf with perfect equanimity to knock the driving band off a dud. If anyone else had tried it, the thing would have exploded, but Tiaden always had, had his luck with him. One morning, two butterflies play in front of our trench. They are brimstone butterflies with red spots on their yellow wings. What can they be looking for here? There is not a plant nor a flower for miles. They settle on the teeth of a skull. The birds, are, the birds too, are just as careful, are carefree. They have long since accustomed themselves to war. Every morning, larks ascend from no man's land. A year ago, we watched them nesting. The young ones grew up too. We have a spell from the rats in the trench. They are in no man's land. We know what for. They grow fat. When we see one, we have a crack at it. At night, we hear again the rolling behind the enemy lines. All day, we have only the normal shelling so that we are able to repair the trenches. There's always plenty of amusement. The airmen see to that. There are countless, there are countless fights for us to watch every day. Battle planes don't trouble us, but the observation planes we hate like the plague. They put, artil they put the artillery to us. A few minutes after they appear, shrapnel and high explosives begin to drop on us. We lose 11 men in one day that way, and five of them stretcher bearers. Two are smashed so that Tiaden remarks you could scrape them off the wall of the trench with a spoon and bury them in a mess tin. Another has the lower part of his body and his legs torn off. Dead, his chest leans against the side of the trench, his face is lemon yellow. His beard still burns like a cigarette. His, in his beard still burns a cigarette. It glows until it dies out on his lips. We put the dead in a large shell hole. So far, there are three layers, one on top of the other. 